baselines can really be optimized when you look for the empty space in the composition and occupy it. What's up guys, welcome back to Lowen University. In today's video, I'm going to be analyzing the baseline for Ventura Highway by America, which was a pop folk sort of rock group from way back when. This is a very old song, uh, but this one I grew up listening to and it's one that I um, credit for so much of my bass playing style, believe it or not. Uh, America's a great group, catchy songs. If you've listened to the radio ever, you know who this band is. Uh, this is a household name band, so. Um, but this is one of the first songs I heard at an early age on the radio that really drew my attention into the bass. And despite all of America's songs being great, this song in particular had a session musician playing on it by the name of Joe Osborne, who was a member of the famous Wrecking Crew, which was a collective of studio musicians in L.A. Uh, back in the 60s, all the way through the 80s. It contained everybody from bass player Carol Kay, Tommy Tedesco, Hal Blaine, uh, probably 20 to 30 musicians uh, throughout that period that played on like a thousand records. And you might not know any of these people, but they've played on songs you've heard. Uh, and it's kind of the controversy about the studio musicians back then where they didn't, they didn't get a lot of credit or they were kind of ghost writing or ghost playing, but... That's another story for another day. But Joe Osborne is a bass player I find very interesting. Um, his playing is so unique, and there's some really quirky things about it that we'll get into in this video. Uh, but we'll get there soon. Let's go ahead and jump in. This is Ventura Highway by America. This is the ultimate driving down the song, <laughs> driving down the road with your windows down song, for sure. Chewing on a piece of grass, walking down the road. Tell me how long you gonna stay. Okay, so the first thing about this bass line that I love is it's a very unique tone. A couple things about Joe Osborne that I, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but I've well read this over the years. Uh, between interviews and you know anecdotes and just different things, because I've really followed this guy for a long time after I finding out about all my favorite songs he played on that I had no idea. Um, this guy used a pick, despite what it sounds like. It's a very muffled, warm, rubbery tone. Um, I'm not sure what bass it was recorded on. I know he played Lakeland basses at one point. This might be a P bass. Kind of sounds like it to me, but one of the things that he's well known for is never changing his bass strings. I think I read somewhere once that 10 to 15 years using the same bass strings, and it has that dead sound. It kind of is compressed and warm, uh, and when you really put all of these different songs by different bands, so The Fifth Dimension, he played on Aquarius, Let the Sunshine In, Ventura Highway, I think... California Dream and Mamas and the Papas. I might be wrong, but if you go through his discography from all these different bands and play his songs side by side, this is the common thread that links them together. You can just recognize that bass tone. And another really interesting thing that is, is that he rarely played anything on the low E string. I'll get to that here in a second. But one thing I want to point out in this section, there's no drums. It's just some chickety chackety kind of guitar, a vocal, the bass is kind of coming in before the drums. Usually, you know, the drums and bass kind of come in together. But he's kind of taking this melodic approach, just kind of going all through the scale. This is based in D major. And I should probably use a pick to get this tone, but it's, it's, it, the strings are so dead, you can just hear it. So to get this tone, I'm kind of going all neck pickup here, um, treble all the way down. I'm boosting some low mids to give it some warmth, um, probably three, 400 range. And I'm cranking the bass just a little bit. And I'm kind of using a, a soft, smooth tone for, uh, from the Helix. Let's keep listening, but listen for this very warm bass tone. It's great. Some people say this town don't look good in snow. Listen how melodic, how much that's moving through the scale. I mean, normally kind of going upbeats like that over a vocal is kind of weird. There's a vocal going on, you're going. 
but it works here. You know why? Because there's no drums. There's a very kind of backbeat. It's kind of percussive. I don't know if it's just like a snare hitting. It's kind of mixed, really folky. The drums aren't big and wide and, you know, kind of wrapping around in the surround sound spectrum. Uh, this uh, Drums are very up the center, very quiet, and they come in eventually, but the bass is kind of driving the rhythm because right now you just have a vocal and the guitar is kind of going... There's really no, like, pulse. So the bass is melodically and rhythmically kind of driving it. So if you go back and kind of listen to this intro, you'll just listen to the note choices and where it falls on the beat. It's almost merging mel melody and rhythm at the same time. Tell me how long you gonna stay here, Joe. Some people say this town don't look good in snow. You don't care, I know Venture a highway In the sun now, when the drums come in here, it's got a little more drive, so he kind of lays back and stops going all over the scale. Uh, once again, we're D major, so before that, he's kind of going. All over the place, you know, we're just in D major. The drums kick in kind of here on this chorus. Ventura Highway. Um, he's kind of sticking back to the root, the fourth, the fifth. That kind of thing. Um, so it's a really just beautiful finesse on when to lay back. Um, and I, if you've looked at any of my lessons before, if you're a member of lowenuniversity.com or if you looked at those lessons, I talk so much. In fact, I have an entire instructional book called Advanced Rock Bass out through Hal Leonard where I talk about bass lines can be optimized by filling in the empty space in a composition where nothing is. Let me say that again. Bass lines can really be optimized when you look for the empty space in the composition and occupy it. And then when something more important comes through, whether it be a drum beat, a guitar solo, a vocal, you pull back. And it's that kind of ebb and flow of getting out in front and pulling back that really is what epitomizes great bass playing to me and really making the bass have a presence, but being responsible and not stepping on toes. Let's keep listening. Where the days are longer, the nights are stronger than moonshine. You're gonna go, I know. Now, something I, I want to point out from what I said earlier. Um, I don't know if this is something Joe came out and said in past interviews. Uh, I spent a lot of years on talk bass, uh, reading just everything about bass. Um, and either someone pointed out, bottom line, he rarely plays the low E string. And then there's an extra layer to that where he really only plays on the A and the D strings. So it's almost like he would just need a two-string bass, and that would fulfill most of what he played on a lot of records. I'm not saying he never uses the G string. I'm not saying he never uses the E string. But he tends to stay off of these kind of low four frets on the E string. If it's an A, he plays the open A, open D, and instead of playing a D up here, he tends to do it up here. And I just want to say you can kind of hear that and I'm paraphrasing. I wish I, if I'll try to find the source of this and link it in the description or at least post it in a comment. But from what I remember reading in an interview, he said that staying on the same string. So if I were to play A, D, E, F sharp, A, I could go. Or he would, he would play it like this. 
And I think the claim was is that staying on the same string kept the timbre of the notes more similar because obviously a D here is going to sound way different than a D here. Same pitch. This is tinny or closer to the nut. The notes are going to be more. But when you get up here and play the on the lower strings, the notes a little bit more, ooh, they're a little bit more woofier. Um, you're getting further away from the nut. Less tension here. It's going to kind of ring out a lot more. So I think what he was imitating is that it kind of has a more synth-based, warm, just uniform sound. Um, and that's really what draws me into this bass line. It just has like the, the same tone. It's almost like it's fake sounding to me. Falling star, waiting for the early train. Sorry, boy, but I've been hit by a purple rain. I love these little fills he puts in. Oh, come on, Joe. You can always change your name. Thanks a lot, son. Just the same. Venture a highway. That's the lowest note he's played this entire piece. And I think it was just a low A string. Listen. So this entire piece, if you go back and listen, he really hasn't gone lower than this note, low D. All the Gs. He's kind of stayed all above this D. And I'm, I don't know if this was intentional, but in this kind of last chorus drive, he, he hits the low A for the first time ever, and it kind of has this filling sound. It's almost like he intentionally waited to hit that low A for like the second chorus. I would love to think that was strategic because it's definitely effective. Saving low notes for when they really matter. You know, if you start an entire bass piece playing up here, and all of a sudden on the second chorus you go down to the low B, it's gonna it's gonna be impactful. So things to think about when you're writing bass lines. You know, if everything's low, then choose your high notes carefully. If everything's kind of mid range, you know, put in some low notes on that second chorus. It really just it juxtaposed with playing high all the time. That low note has some impact. So. Listen, let me go back a little bit. You can always change your name. Thanks a lot, son. Just the you know, it's same. all up here. Venture a highway in the sunshine where the days are it's effective. It's effective, that low A. And this sounds so simple, me telling you this, but when you listen to the whole piece, and it, he's kind of up here in this mid-register, it pulls your ear in. And now, I believe for the rest of the song, he really never goes that low again. So it kind of makes me think that was intentional. I don't know, but as a listener who grew up absorbing this bass line, obviously you can tell I've listened to this so much, but I always that stood out to me. It really did. I saw stronger than moonshine E minor. He never hits the low E. Never once. It's always this E. And I just find that interesting. Like, why not hit the low E? I think there's a reason for it. It it just keeps his bass kind of in that mid-range. He's occupying a certain kind of space. Way high. 
goes a little low there. And this is kind of another tool. The song is over. You've sang your verses. You've sang your choruses. The do 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 that kind of stuff it there's no words it's just the voice is kind of just harmonizing a melodic role so it's like he just takes a nod from that and says okay i'm gonna go back to being melodic kind of he's going all the way up here over the place it's very cool uh you know just as a a kid getting a bass in high school and hearing that i'm like man that that's it's just tasteful and i feel like this this song and i want you back by the jackson five were just like two songs that you listen to passively in the radio driving around with your parents when you were in high school middle school and these come on the radio because we listen to classic music all the time growing up and i would just hear these bass lines some songs i didn't notice the bass some i did and it would stand out and it would really draw me in it's like the bass had its own melody and a lot of people really appreciate the bass lines i put on albums i played on over the years that you know i get comments a lot that they're melodic and you know, they have like their own melody that's different from the, you know, the vocal or the guitar, or the lead guitar. I've been kind of doing my own thing. And I appreciate feedback like that. But these are the songs that got me thinking like that. You know, if you listen to the song, the bass honestly is all over the place. It's arguably kind of stepping on the vocal at times, but it's just, it's just restrained enough to be a driving melodic force in the song. So I'm going to go back and listen to that last part. I want you to pay attention to what I'm talking about. In the sun. So that was Ventura Highway by America. I believe this was released in the 70s, and I still think as far as tasteful, melodic, ingenuitive, creative bass playing, this stands the test of time to me. It's a very well-thought-out bass line. The tone really fills in some warmth because, again, this song is just a lot of, a lot of mid-range acoustic little diddling, diddling. You know, there's a chord underneath it just kind of just chickety chickety. And the bass comes in with this complete opposite sound. It's very warm, and it's kind of weaving in and out of the chord progression. And uh, there's a lot to be learned from songs like this. You know, you might think, oh, this song's 50 years old. You know, it's, it's in the past. These guys knew what they were doing. And kind of a cool story about Joe Osborne. He moved back to my hometown here in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, I don't know if he had roots here, but... Uh, the last few years of his life, I think he passed, yeah, he passed away in 2018. And right before that, I found out he lived near me and I always wanted to meet the guy. And I wanted, I wanted to tell him why this song was so important to me as a bass player. I just wanted the chance to do it. And I never got to, and may his music and bass playing always live on. But at one point when he passed away, I believe his family was going to a state sale, his estate belongings things and the original handwritten notes and chart for this song went up and i didn't hear about it until it was sold but i would have loved to have that but anyway i have a lot of respect for this player uh there's a lot to be learned from those who came before us in music uh because everything is influenced by something that once was and this was definitely the case for me Thanks for watching. Please put in the comments and let me know other cool bass lines you'd like to hear me dissect and go through. Uh, it can be something you think I've heard or not heard, but I just want to dig in, dive deep, and geek out on all things bass with you guys. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we will see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>